63. And it says, you, God, are my God, and earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you in a dry and parched land where there is no water. I have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory. And because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. And I will praise you as long as I live. And in your name, I will lift up my hands. I will be fully satisfied as with the richest of foods. With singing lips, my mouth will praise you. On my bed, I remember you and I think of you through the watches of the night. And because you are my help, I sing in the shadow of your wings. I cling to you. And your right hand upholds me. And I love those Last words, I cling to you. You know, imagine having such a hunger and thirst for God that you're comparing your heart for God to a person who's traveling through a weary desert where there is no water for days, and then you're thinking how thirsty you are, and that's how thirsty you are for God. And you're so hungry and thirsty for God and that you know that him and his presence are the thing that fills you just like you would be filled with the richest banquet. And that you're so consumed with God that even when you lie down to sleep at night, your heart and your mind are still thinking about him. You're listening for his voice. You're reaching out to him in every way. You are literally clinging to him with everything that is in you. You know, hunger and thirst does much. It attracts the presence of God when we have that kind of hunger and thirst. You know, there's something happening in colleges around the nation, young people are experiencing revival in those colleges. Small chapel services that were meant to last only 45 minutes to an hour have now gone on for days, 24 hours a day, day and night. That's hunger. And when people describe what's happening, they just said the presence of Jesus is there and it's changing everything. And that's what we want. We want the presence of Jesus but we also want the hunger that brings and attracts that presence. We want the thirst of God to be in our heart so that we know who we're reaching out for, who we're singing to, who we're lifting our hands to. It's not just something that we do on a Sunday. There's a person here, the person of Jesus, and he changes everything. Amen. Let's stand together so we can pray. Jesus, give us a hunger for you like we had at the beginning when we first discovered who you are and our hearts, Lord, just couldn't get enough of you or your word. Today, Lord, I pray that your presence would be here touching every heart and every life and those who are watching today. And I pray that you would do such a work in our hearts that you would bring us to that place again where our love for you is renewed, it is deep, it is unquenchable, and it continues to cling to you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Do whatever you want to Do whatever 
Smile.
this is my surrender here is where i lay it down you are all i'm chasing now this is my surrender this is my surrender
worship you, I live to worship you. Joy in the house of the Lord. 
Let's shout out a praise to Jesus right now. Woo! I thought there was something extra. I always interrupt. I didn't want to didn't want to do that this time. There is joy in the house of the Lord. I hope you're happy today because of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So give him one more shout, just as loud as you can. He can hear that, amen. So let's go ahead and dismiss the uh, kids today and the teenagers. While you're dismissing real quick, I'll go through the announcements. There's a men's fellowship dinner on March 13th at 6 p.m. Information's out on the uh, greeters table. There's a sign up there. Uh, There's a suggested donation of a million dollars. So just, if one of you just signs up for that, it takes care of everybody else. So anyway, you you may be seated. But that men's fellowship dinner, uh, Dwayne, I think, is out there running the table. It's after after service, so make sure you sign up. We're going to get together. We're going to worship. We're going to listen to the word. We're going to get to know one another a little bit better than we have. Amen. Amen. So I'm very excited about that. And uh, I guess I got to do the offering, too. I always forget about the offering. Let's just pray. There's four ways to give, and you know that, so put that on the wall. Four ways to give. But let's just pray real quick. Father, it is not in my word that these people receive blessing from trusting you and obeying you. It is from your word. And it is my prayer today, Lord God, that they trust your word more than they trust anyone else's that they just really believe that you will keep the promises that you keep when it comes to us trusting you more than we trust money, that we can't serve God and mammon. And that we would really trust that if we trust you, that you'll fill our barns, that you will bless us, that you will encourage us through providing for us at times when, Father, we don't know how where the provision is going to come from because we've lived lives of faith and obedience to your word. Encourage your hearts, Father. Bless those that do trust you right now, but bless those that are trying to encourage them to just go full out and putting their faith in you today. In Jesus we pray. And all God's people said, amen. amen. I had a a way I was going to do this service, and uh, then I changed my mind. I can do that. That's not only a woman's prerogative, that's a pastor's prerogative. I was just, it was, yeah, no, nah, I'm not even going to get into it. Let's uh, turn to Judges chapter 7 in verse 1. You're going to see one verse on the wall today, and we're going to leave that up there, and it'll make sense at the end. But you're going to get a lot, of, a lot of other verses coming with it. Judges chapter 7 verse 1. And one more time, can we pray one more time? Because I need it. So it's all about me today. Not really. Father, I know what your word says. And sometimes, Father, I'll just be honest, I wonder why you ask me to speak on the things that I speak on when I speak on them. There's something going on in the hearts of the people of this congregation you're trying to encourage and help. There also might be some things, Lord, going on in this congregation that you need to correct. I believe very much that you are a God of of encouragement, but a God of warning. So I'm not saying that to scare anybody, Father. I'm just saying that that is a, a hard tension to navigate when I'm trying to make sure that I'm speaking what you want to say to these people, not what I want to say to these people. So it is my prayer, and this is something that you put on my heart this week that I just have fallen in love with. It is my prayer today, God is glorified, that hell is horrified, and that the church is edified. That's my prayer for these people today that you be glorified, that Satan be horrified, and that this body be edified. Encourage our hearts, Lord God, with that. In Jesus we pray. And all God's people said.
This is a passage of scripture that I've preached numerous times throughout the years. And I haven't preached it wrong. I'm not saying that I've preached it wrong, but I have preached it one-sided. And it's what I love about the word of God the most. It's not that the word of God changes because the word of God doesn't change. But something it says can, through the perspective of experience and time, contain a truth you never saw. Maybe a greater truth. And that's kind of what's happening today. I'm going to preach something I never imagined that I would preach in a way that I never imagined I would preach it. But before we get there, and we'll get there, I want to remind us of some context. In this story in Judges chapter 7, and we'll get there, Israel had rejected the word of God concerning the worship of idols. It's not that they didn't worship Yahweh. It's that they worshiped Baal. And Yahweh was the God of salvation, and Baal was the God of provision. And there are times in our lives where we worship not just the God of salvation, but we worship the God of provision. We worship our jobs or our ability or our money or our thing, whatever, whatever our idol, our family, whatever we worship more than God, sometimes we, we kind of make them be the providers of, of, of life and, and power to us. To bring them back into a true relationship with Yahweh, God allowed the enemies to infiltrate their nation. And God chastened the children of Israel through financial, physical, and emotional ruin. I believe that's kind of what the the Bible teaches that God will do to, to bring his children back. That's part of the chastening of God. So God sent a preacher to call out their sin. He sent Jesus to call out their salvation. And he sent the Spirit of God to represent the presence of God in Gideon's life. And if you remember, Gideon was a nobody hiding from an enemy, yet caring for his people. And that was just a little part of something we preached back in November. So if you haven't been here since November, you probably wouldn't know that. He had doubts like all of us do, yet he was obedient. He tore down his father's idols and then challenged God with a fleece. And we talked about that last week. And finally, he submitted and surrendered to the work that God called him to, calling together an army to fight with him. And that's where we come into the story today. Gideon gathered an army of 32,000 men. 32,000, which seems like a lot, except they were fighting an army of 125,000. So he's an underdog. He's also not a well-known leader, so it's not that people would automatically follow him because he wasn't, wouldn't be their first pick as leader because he was a, a nobody uh, in his nation. So he's got this army gathered together. It's not as many as he needs. He's got his own weaknesses, but it's not enough really. And then in verse 2 of chapter 7 of Judges, the Lord says to Gideon, the people with you are too many for me. You've got too much money in the bank. And you would say, I don't got enough money in the bank. But for God, it's too much. Amen? Amen? Too many for me to give the Midianites into their hand, lest Israel boast over me, saying, Mine own hand hath saved me. God has a concern that has plagued believers throughout history. There seems to be a biblical tendency for humanity to take glory away from deity by claiming their own victory. God gives us victory and we take the glory. We say, Look at what I did. Look at what I, I'm, I'm such a perfect person. God had to bless me. I'm, I'm such, so smart and I'm so wise and I'm so strong that this victory that I got came really from my power. I'll give God a little bit of glory, but I'm going to take some for myself. The Apostle Paul talked about this and how God gave him a thorn in the flesh so he'd always be humble and not get tempted by, and, and be getting, get tempted by Satan to become prideful. So to humble himself, to humble him, God gave him a thorn in the flesh. Even as Jesus was tempted in the wilderness by Satan, 
He had to be careful that his humanity wouldn't succumb to pride. It is easy for us to succumb to, the, to, to pride. Deuteronomy 8.17 says, Beware lest you say in your heart, My power and might of my hand has given me this wealth. Deuteronomy 8.17 Psalm 115.1 says, Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory for the sake of your steadfast love and faithfulness. The glory is not supposed to come to us. It's supposed to be about the Lord. But there's a tendency for us to want to have the glory brought to ourselves. For us to get praised, to us to get honor, when it's really God doing the work for us and with us. So God has this elegant solution to the problem of, of, of pride. In verse 3 of Judges chapter 7, he says, Now therefore proclaim in the ears, because he just said, there's too many for me. Now therefore proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whoever is fearful and trembling, let him return home and hurry away from Mount Gilead. Then 22,000 of the people returned and 10,000 remained. So he went from 32,000 to fight 125,000 to 10,000 to fight 125,000. Because God's decision was, let's let the fearful go home. Why? Why would he let the fearful go home? Because the fearful panic when pressed. And that panic spreads to other people. Have you ever felt good about something? Like things are going well and everything's happy. And then all of a sudden your wife says something that makes you afraid because she's afraid. Like you're confident in what you're doing. You're confident in where you're going. Like everything's at peace. And then somebody has a fear. Then, then they pass that fear on to you. Is that not part of your life? Or is that just my wife? <laughs> Throughout history, generals have understood the danger of those filled with anxiety. And know how it can become a greater enemy to victory than the enemy itself. In fact, several battles in the Civil War, men were shot in the back whole groups of men were shot in the back because one man would turn and run the other direction and then everyone else would get scared and follow them, making them easy targets. So God says, send home the fearful. 10,000 remains. And the Bible says this in Judges chapter 7, verse 4. And the Lord said to Gideon, the people are still too many. Come on, man. I already don't have enough. And then you let all the people who are afraid go home, get a cop out. And I'm left with 10,000. And now you're still saying there's too many for me. And he says, take them down to the water and I will test them for you there. So God says, this next group that I'm going to deal with, let me test them. I'm going to find out whether you want to keep them or not. And he goes on to say to Gideon, and anyone to whom I say to you, this one shall go with you, shall go with you. And anyone to whom I say to you, this one shall not go with you, shall not go. So he brought the people down to the water. So, so God says to Gideon, if I tell you, don't take this person, don't take this person. But God says, if I tell you to take this person, take that person. But, but the power of choice is in the hand of God. Let's just make that perfectly clear. In this passage of scripture, the power of choice is in the hand of God. It's not in Gideon's hand. It's not in the people's hands. God says, I'm going to test these people. And if I say no, that means no. If I say go, that means go. Are you with me? So he brought the people down to the water. And the Lord said to Gideon, everyone who laps water with his tongue as a dog laps, you shall set by himself. Likewise, everyone who kneels down to drink and the number of those who lapped putting their hands in their mouth with 300 men, the rest of the people knelt down to drink water. Now remember, God says, if I say no, they don't go. But if I say go, they go. So the picture was this. There's, there's two ways to drink water. And I'll see if I can do this and get back up. Might have to have Pat come pick me up after I fall. So, so one would lap like a dog and he would just stick his head in the water and drink that way because that's what dogs do. And the other one would take his hand and he would put it, put it down into the water and bring it up to his mouth. But he's looking around. He's paying attention to what's going on. So there's two types of people that he was looking for that he was testing to find out how they would drink the water. And that would tell him a lot about who that person was. And remember, I'll say it again. If God says no, they won't go. 
So why did God send the 9,700 home? Because he only left them with 300. Because with an enemy in the vicinity, the vicinity, there was a group that were careless, not cautious. And I call them the arrogant. You can call them prideful. They, they just thought that they were fine. That they didn't worry about it. They had an enemy around them, surrounding them, but they still weren't, weren't wise. They were cautious. They were were, were careless, not cautious. And God doesn't need the arrogant in his army. God doesn't need the arrogant in his army. He always has resisted the proud. He resisted the proud when Satan rose up and said, I want to be like the most high God. And God said, get out. He's always resisted the proud. And history teaches that the arrogant in an army can sow discord in the ranks. Causing the, 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 the soldiers to go against the, the orders that have been given them. And to disrespect and disre- not respond to the, to the men that God has given them to give orders. And they know that God in his word, if you read his Bible, you'll find that he spends a great amount of time showing illustration after illustration after illustration of how the arrogant cripple a movement of God. Because they're constantly fighting the people and the plans that God has put in place. So from a list of things that the Lord hates, not dislikes, not disapproves of, but God hates. And I have people tell me all the time when I use the word hate, that's a very strong word. Yes, it is. God hates these things. In Proverbs chapter 6 and verse 16, if you want to turn there real quick. Proverbs 6 and 16 There are six things that the Lord hates, seven that are an abomination to him. Now, let me just stop, and I don't want to offend anybody, so be careful with with what I'm doing with this point. But the point is that there are those who don't realize that this that we're going to talk about is an abomination to God. And there are other things that Christians talk about that are abomination to God, but we we don't think that this is an abomination We can live these things that I'm going to talk about here in a minute and not realize God hates these things. There are six things that the Lord hates. Seven are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes. Thinking you're better than you are. That's pride. A lying tongue. You think you can get away with dishonesty. How prideful is that? Hands that shed innocent blood. You think you have power over people who are innocent. And you think you have the authority to take their life. To shed their blood. How arrogant is that? The humans think that they have the right to take a life that's not theirs to take. A heart that devises wicked plans. How prideful can we be that we devise plans that are our plans that that are wicked. They're not plans of God. Feet that make haste to run to evil. A false witness who breathes out lies. And one that sows discord among the brothers. God hates the prideful. I'm going to say it one more time because I don't know if you got this or not. God hates the prideful. They are an abomination to him. All seven of these things are forms of pride. Romans 16 and verse 17, Paul says, and I, because I believe Paul wrote the book of Romans, says, I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you have been taught. Avoid them, for such persons do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own appetites, and by smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the hearts of the naive. There are those who are so prideful They can cause divisions and obstacles. And he's talking about in Christianity or in the church. Titus chapter 3 and verse 9 says, But avoid foolish controversies, genealogies, dissensions, and quarrels about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. As for a person who stirs up division, after warning him once and then twice, have nothing to do with him, knowing that that such a person is warped and sinful, he is self-condemned. God in his word says that a worthless man in Proverbs 6.14 has a perverted heart that devises evil and continually sows discord. God hates prideful people. 
I know you came for something more lightweight, but I'm just going to tell you, I was sick to my stomach all day praying over this passage of Scripture that I'm bringing you today. The Apostle Paul said there's always danger of grievous wolves rising up in the church seeking to get people to follow them in their ways. False teachers can seem to get silly women to view their scripture, view the scripture the way they want to view it. And God puts people to the test to find out if they're prideful or not. God will put you to the test to find out if you're prideful or not. He might take away something that you think is yours. He might take away an opportunity that was yours. He might step you down from where you were and try to humble you. He might take away a blessing that he was going to give you that you think you have a right to. And it offends the arrogant to think that God might just call them to be a servant of servants. Stay back and support the soldiers who he's called to fight the battle. This gets better in a minute, trust me. And this is how I've preached this for 25 years. That God says it's too much for me. I'm not interested in the fearful, those filled with anxiety. I'm not, I, I can't use them, send them home. And I can't use the prideful because they're just going to get in the way of the things that I'm going to try to accomplish. In verse 7 of Judges chapter 7, And the Lord said to Gideon, With these 300 men that lapped, I will save you and give the Midianites into your hand and let all the others go, every man to his home. Let all the others go. Let all the others go. 300 to fight 125,000, send everyone else home. Does not make sense. Doesn't make sense. Wrap your mind around that for a moment. God says, I'm, I'm going to do something great with 300 that I can't do with 32,000. It's too much for me. Too many for me. I don't need that many. Now, you know how the story ends if you've read the passage. Gideon gets victory with his 300. They defeat the enemy. And they had nothing but the word of God and a man of God to lead them. And this is where perspective becomes important because if you look at Gideon, who's a nobody, no one would have chosen him. But he had the word of God from a preacher, from Jesus and the Holy Spirit. It was not going to be by the power of Gideon that he was going to get victory. It was going to be by the power of God. And 32,000 was too much for him. And 10,000 was too much for him. He didn't need the fearful. He didn't need the prideful. God knows that the fearful will just create more anxiety, causing people to lose faith. And there might be somebody in your life that is causing you to lose faith right now. They're casting doubt. They're casting discouragement in, in your life. They're trying to confuse you with what they say is truth. And God knows the arrogant just sow discord, crippling the enemy through complaint and criticism. And he knows that that's going to be a problem to do the things that he wants to do. And Gideon took an undermanned army and defeated an overwhelming enemy. He had the plan of God's word, the promise of God's word, the presence of God's word, in the, which is the sword of the Lord and of Gideon, which is a sermon for another day, and the baby doesn't like this message. She's new. This is her first time in church, so she's a first-time visitor, so give her some grace. Next week, we'll talk about discipline. I want to revisit a couple of things after saying all of that to bring this truth to light. In Judges 7, 2, the Bible says, the people with you are too many for me. 7, 4 says, the people are still too many. I will test them there, and if anyone says to you, this one shall not, if I say to you, this one shall not go, they shall not go. But if I say this one shall go, that's who you take. Take that person with you. 
In verse 7 of Judges chapter 7, let all others go every man to his home. I never preached it that way before. I'm missing a page. Amen, I have the same problem. Okay. Hang on. I know where I'm going. A couple things I want you to notice out of this whole story that we've talked about. God doesn't need what we think he needs to do what he's going to do. We think there's not enough that we need more. But God is enough because he said there's too many for me. There was already too many for Gideon. There was already too many for the armies of Israel. There was already too many. He, there, there wasn't, they didn't have enough. They needed God. And God is fully capable of doing anything he wants to, however he wants to, with whoever he wants to, and get victory. We think we need more money, more love, more peace, but all we really need is more God. We need more God. You need more God in your life. You want more love? Stop looking for it in a human being and look for it in God. He will give you more love than you will know what to do with. You need more peace? Look for that peace in God. He'll give you more than you can imagine. Second thing, God may not need you. This goes against everything that's being preached in American churches this morning, I promise you that. Because I can see the world creeping into the church where we just think that God can't do this without me. And God can very well do whatever God wants to do without you. He saved human, humankind without, without your help. He sent his only son to die on the cross for you, for me. He didn't need the fearful. He didn't need the arrogant. God may not need you. Now, let me just say this real quick. He didn't rebuke them or refuse them. He just didn't use them and sent them home. That's what sparks interest to me about this level of God that I've never seen before. Normally, we would say, you're fearful. Go home. He didn't do that. You might say, you're prideful, go home. He didn't do that. He just didn't use them. God knew that Gideon didn't need the anxious. This this isn't your fight. If fear is your problem, go home. It's okay. God knew that Gideon would not need the arrogant. This isn't your fight. Listen, we're better off. As an army, to not have to fight you if we're going to fight an enemy. That If i got to fight the devil, I don't want to fight you either. Amen? There's nothing worse than fighting an enemy within. Some of you have got some battles going on in your homes. You don't need that fight in your home. There's enough to fight in the world. Proverbs 21 9 says, It's better to live in the corner of a housetop than a house shared with a quarrelsome wife. I didn't mean to pick that up. I just, it's just, I was throwing softballs at that one. God said, No. Don't use the fearful. Let them go home. Let them go home and gain some courage. Why don't you go home? And study the scripture. Why don't you sit under the preaching for a while. And listen to what the man of God says about the word of God. So you can find confidence in what the word of God says. So you yourself then would have courage. Instead of fear. Maybe it's just going home. And saying okay. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to be that mighty warrior today. I'm, I just don't have it in me. I need courage. Find it in the word of God. God. 
God said no. God said no to the arrogant. Go home and find out what humility is. You know, it would be humbling to think that Jesus would show up in this room and say to some of you, no, I don't need you. I don't need you, I don't need you, I don't need you. Wouldn't that be humbling? Because we all want to be included. We all want to be thought of as, as a mighty warrior. We all want to be thought of that God would choose us. I mean, have you ever been that person who was the last one picked? What if you're the person that no one picks? And they just get to the end of the, end of the line and say, why don't you just, just go home? That'd be humbling. No, we live, in a, we live in a world that's gotten into the church where everyone must fight and everyone must lead and everyone must be this and everyone must be that. Hey, you know what? It might be that you're just not in a place where you can do that. And God's saying to Gideon, just send the fearful home and send the arrogant home, send the prideful home, just send them home. Jesus in his word taught that everyone needs to be a servant means you're not, not always included in every plan of the master. In fact, we're going to read a passage in a few weeks where it talks about how, um, it talks about something really cool. I'm missing my page, so I'm going off this. Where they were weary, they, um, faint yet pursuing. There we go. I knew I'd get the passage of scripture. They were, the 300 were running after the enemy and they were faint yet pursuing. And so they went to their friends and said, hey, could you feed us? Could you take care of us? Could you, could you give us something? To, to, to sustain us so we can stay in this fight. And the friends, the family of, of Israel said no. They were supposed to be servants. They didn't get to be in the fight, but they were supposed to be in the servants of those who were in the fight. Sometimes maybe what you're called to do is just help those who are in the fight stay in the fight. Maybe you'll have your chance at the battle. Maybe you'll have your chance at the war. Maybe you'll have your place when you humble yourself and you stop being so afraid all the time that God says, hey, I want to choose you. I want to choose that person. The prideful don't like this because they want to be included in everything. They want to make decisions and they want to make directions. Instead of realizing, why don't you just let God choose who he wants to use and who he doesn't? Jesus said this in Mark chapter 10, 43, but it shall not be so among you, but whoever was great among you must be your servant. Do you realize what he's saying is the great ones are the ones who learn to serve other people when they're not cho chosen to lead or fight. And the last thing I want you to know as you study this passage of scripture, you're going to learn that God's not always in the big. We have this idea that God's always in the earthquake and sometimes he is in the earthquake. And we think that sometimes God's in the thunder. God sometimes is in the thunder. But sometimes God's in the still small voice. He's not always in the big thing. And so I've heard this said numerous times by people say, say I'm looking for the big church because the big church must be where God is. If you have paid attention to anything going on in the church world with mega churches lately, You'll notice that just because there's lots of people attending a church doesn't mean that God's in it. Because if the pastor's playing with porn and playing with prostitutes, there's a, a guy in Florida that got uh, accused of messing around with some prostitutes. And he's still a mega church pastor. And people are still attending his church. Please do not tell me that God is in the midst of that. I'm going to go for a swim if you guys don't get behind me. <laughs> He's not always in the big. Sometimes he's in the small. We want to say that if God's in it, we need a million to defeat 125,000. What if God says, no, I'll give you 300. Well, God can't be in that. Why can't he? God can't do anything with my tiny offering. Yet wasn't it a widow woman who put in everything that she had that God, that Jesus noticed? Now, I'm going to tell a story that I hope I get right because I'm doing it by memory. And the older I get, the worse my memory gets. <laughs> At the age of 15, a man by the name of Charles Spurgeon 
was going to church. And it was snowing really heavily that day. So on his way to church, he had to take a side street to kind of get off the, away from the snow because it was so heavy. And he ended up looking for shelter in this tiny little, Meth I think it was, was an ancient Methodist church. And he went in there to find this Methodist church. There's a, a, a lay preacher that was preaching there. He was um, new. He was, didn't know anything. And he preached one passage of scripture. Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth. For I am God and there is no other. Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. He didn't know what else to say, so he just kept saying that over and over and over again. Because he lost his last page of notes. <laughs> How appropriate. Whoever stole that page. He just kept saying it over and over and over again. And he finally, he looked at Charles Spurgeon and he said, look at that young man there. He looks miserable. I'm pointing to Pastor Mark because I know you don't believe that to be true. <laughs> Can't point to anybody else. He looks miserable. And later on, he reads the passage again and he says it again. He said, he says, I can't remember what he said. He said, oh, you need to, you need to open your eyes up to the truth. And so he, Charles Spurgeon said at that moment, he understood what it meant to be forgiven of sins. He understood who Jesus was. And he understood that all he needed to have was faith in Jesus Christ to be saved. And Charles Spurgeon started to walk home and he said he noticed that every snowflake that fell to the ground was saying to him, your sins are white as snow. Your sins are white as snow. Your sins are white as snow. And he went home and he opened the door and his mom said, something happened to you at church today. Charles began to dig into the word of God and found out that if you're saved, you should get baptized. So Charles got scheduled to be baptized four months later. And after that, he joined a church. Charles Spurgeon went on to pastor one of the largest churches in the world in his day. Led thousands to Christ. But he wasn't saved in the big church. He got saved in a little tiny church where an itinerant lay preacher who didn't even know what he was doing but repeated over and over again, turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. And I know we live in a country where people want to go to the big church because that's where the best speakers are and you got stuck with me today. <laughs> and I am not having the best physical day today, if you can tell. And I lost a page of my notes <laughs> That threw me off. And some of you might be saying, well, I wish you would have put more scripture on the wall. That's the only one that you needed to read today anyway. We could have thrown out everything that I've said before that and just, just tossed it in the garbage can and said, listen, turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. But we think we need all this other stuff and God says, no, that's too much for me. That's too many for me. That's too, you don't need that. You need that. That silly little passage of scripture that you should be underlining in your Bibles. Turn to me and be saved all the ends of the earth. For I am God and there is no other. I have no idea where to go from here because I don't have my notes. So let's stand. If you are struggling with fear and you're feeling anxiety, especially when it comes to the things of God, go home. Not right now, <laughs> but go home. Go home and study the scripture. Find out what God really says and then find, find your strength in what he says. Find your courage in what he says and then start living it according to what it says. If you're prideful, God said no. Let that humble you. 
Let that humble you. Because God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Maybe it's not your day to win the battle. Maybe it's not your day to be in the battle. Maybe it's your day to just sit back and say, okay, I'm just going to serve others today. I'm going to wash others' feet. Because that's what he teaches who's greatest in the kingdom are those who wash other people's feet. But someone in this room or some in this room might be the 300. You might be the ones that God said yes to. And I have no idea what he's going to do with you. I just know it might be your turn to get in the fight. We're going to talk about what that battle looks like in the next few weeks. But let's deal with the fearful and let's deal with the, with the uh, arrogant the anxiety and the arrogance. It's okay. God, I never thought I'd say this, Deborah. I never thought I'd say, preach that truth, that it's okay, go home. Come back next Sunday and just sit and just learn and just grow or serve, sacrifice. See who God really is because God can do great and mighty things with 300. But we're gonna know that it's God that does it. We're not going to be say, look at what Pastor Andy did because he just barked through this whole sermon. We're not going to say it's because of what Pastor Mark started with because that was beautiful. But God's got something bigger planned. We can't say it's because the worship was so great because the worship was great. But it was about him, not about us. God does not need what we think he needs. What he needs is the faithful. And maybe you're not there yet. Study the word. Humble yourself. Let him make you faithful. And God just may not need you now. I just, I'm, I don't know how we're going to get the work of God done if you go home. And I'm saying that because I'm also realizing that God says, it's not your work to get done, it's mine. I'll get it done. And I'll do it with, with, a, with a leader that's crippled and broken and messed up. And I'll do it with a, a people who just are cautious and careful and humble and faithful. What's God saying to you right now? Is he saying to you, turn to me and be saved for all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other? Are you afraid of dying and going to hell because of your sins? God's provided a way for you to be saved. His name is Jesus Christ. Amen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Charles Spurgeon understood that because who was speaking to him was Jesus Christ was speaking to his heart. And the Holy Spirit was speaking to his heart as well. Turn to me and be saved all the ends of the earth for I am God and there is no other. If you're a Christian, can I just say this? turn to him and be saved to all the ends of the earth for he is God there, he's, there's no other God he's the God of salvation and the God of provision he will give you what you need to do to, to defeat the enemy but you've got to trust him let's pray Father, I appreciate the humility that is necessary to do the work that you've called us to do. That you let us know that you are God and there is no other. And out of love today, I just 
hope that you spoke to the people who are fearful and afraid. That you're not mad at them and you're not angry at them and you're not frustrated by them. that they just need to gain some courage. Father, if they stay fearful, that's a problem. But your word creates a boldness and a confidence in us that takes away the fear. Because you haven't given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And Father, there's some in this room that are just prideful. And they didn't recognize it till today that you just said no to them, that you're not going to allow them to be a part of what you're trying to do until they humble themselves. They should go home and start serving their families better, serve their spouses, serve their children, serve their neighbors, serve their friends, serve their church. So that through humility, the next time they'll be careful and cautious so that you can call them into something greater. I thank you for the way you work through small things to show that it's not about us. It's through you. We love you, Jesus. Come on, if you love him, tell him. We love you, Jesus. Some of you need to go home. Some of you you need to go humble. Some of you need to get ready for a fight. I'm right with you. We love you, Jesus. Thank you for bringing us together today. And all God's people said. Can I share something? Absolutely, Pastor. Something Pastor Andy said stirred my heart. And it included this verse that we're reading. And I just want to tell you a testimony. My uncle, which is my mother's brother, and my cousin, his son, recently passed away. And they just passed away a month and a half from each other. And they both died of the same disease, pancreatic cancer. Uh, my cousin, who is, belongs to that family, another brother, he's a Christian, just like I am. And we are always praying for our family members. And both of us were praying for my uncle and for my cousin, who weren't serving Jesus and didn't know Jesus. And when my uncle was realized that he had cancer, He gave his life to Jesus, which was just a powerful answer to those prayers. And I talked to him on the phone, and he just so boldly told me that he had accepted Jesus as his Savior, and he had repented of his sins. And I just encouraged him. I just reinforced what it was to be a believer, and I encouraged him to be bold and to tell all the rest of the family what Jesus had done for him because it would bring everyone great comfort, but it would also speak to others' hearts. He passed away a believer, and I'm thankful for that. But his son, my cousin, who was also sick, was so resistant his whole life to anything religious. He wanted to have nothing to do with God. And he was so much against it that my uncle was afraid to have a funeral service in a church because of what his son might think of all of this and kind of turn family against each other along those lines. So that's how strongly he was against Jesus. But in just the past couple of weeks, he just passed away two days ago. In the past couple of weeks, I had just been praying for him that God would give him room in his heart to repent. And my cousin, who is a believer, went to him, spoke to him. He turned his life to Jesus and he surrendered to him. And he died a believer, too. And so my cousin and I are texting together about what has happened. 
And I was trying to console him because he's lost two people in his family. But he told me, you know, that my brother's a believer. And now he's in heaven with my dad. And he's in heaven with our grandmother. And we both took great comfort in all of that. And I just bring that testimony to you to say, if you're not a believer today, if you haven't surrendered your life to Jesus, then what are you waiting for? Because there is only one God. And he says the only way to be saved is to turn to him. Are we going to wait to the end of our life to turn to him and realize what he can do in our lives? He is so good and merciful and powerful. He does hear the prayer of the person on their deathbed. They get the same reward we had, even if we gave our lives to Jesus as a child and lived our whole life serving him. That's the parable of the one that was hired at the last moment and got the same pay as the one laborers who had worked all day. It doesn't matter, but what, ma what I want to say to you is don't wait. Don't wait to surrender your life to Jesus and don't wait to fully commit your life to him. Because if you do belong to him, just don't live half-heartedly for him. Live your whole life for Jesus because he is everything. Can I pray with you? Lord Jesus, if there's anyone here today who has not surrendered their life to you, including those who are listening online, I pray, Lord, that you would move upon their hearts and the very thing that you're feeling and knowing today, that's Jesus. Because the Bible says that no one comes to the Father, except the Spirit draw him. That's the Holy Spirit working in your life. It's not my words or my testimony or pastor's sermon. It's the Holy Spirit working in your life, tugging at your heart, pulling you toward him. And all you need to do is what it says on the verse that we just read, is to turn to him. To turn to him instead of turning away from him, instead of walking away from him, you just need to turn toward him. And walk toward him. And he will receive you with open arms as a son, as a daughter. Because he's been waiting for you. And for some of you, he's been waiting for you your entire lifetime. And he loves you. Heavenly Father, I pray that for those that you're calling today, that they would simply turn to you, as we've said, confess their sins. And ask to follow you and just believe you. Believe that you are who you are. That you are the only God and there is no other. And I pray, Lord, that as they believe, you would transform and change their lives. Because that's what you do. You make lives new. And we give you thanks for that, Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Amen. Yeah. If you have any questions about Christ, about salvation, don't be afraid to come ask. We're not going to chase you down. We're not going to attack you before you get out the door. But we want to be here to answer any questions that you have and to, to pray with you if you need, need that. We, we, we love you. We want you to know Jesus, Jesus Christ. Let's pray one last time. Father, thank you for not making us fight alone. That while 22,000 fearful went home and 9,700 prideful went home, you left us with 300. And I'm just excited to see what you're going to do with the 300. The 300 might contain somebody new to the kingdom today. How exciting would that be, Father? I pray that you've been glorified. I pray that hell is terrified. And I pray that the congregation is encouraged. We love you, Jesus. Thank you for bringing us together today. I hope the kids have been well, Father. I pray that you pour a special blessing on the children of this church, especially because of the things that are happening in the world. Encourage them to trust you as Savior as children. 
before Satan warps the rest of the world. We love you and we thankful for, we're thankful for you. We love you in Jesus. We pray and all God's people said. Amen. Guys, have a great day. God bless. Go home. I've been saying this.